Monday night, we told you about Martin Priest. He's the man now charged with Tammy Sue Rothganger's murder. The Eldon High School sophomore was just 15 when she disappeared in 1984, and she hasn't been seen since. Priest was her mother's boyfriend, and investigators believe he could be responsible for at least four other deaths. Tonight, we hear from the family of Katrina Chile, one of his alleged victims. It's as we continue to investigate a possible serial killer. We should warn you, though, what you're about to hear might be graphic and disturbing. Martin Priest was a friend of the Chile family in Wichita, Kansas. He was okay. He, he, you know, became friends with all of us. We all hung out together, and he used to come to my house for coffee. Linda asked us to conceal her identity. She's the mother of five, three boys and two girls. Katrina was her oldest. She was a very, very pretty girl, and she had a personality that was unbelievable. She could get you to laugh on your worst day. In November of 1984, Linda says 15-year-old Katrina was running late for school, and Martin Priest said he'd take her. When Katrina didn't come home from school that day, Linda knew something was wrong. I was just devastated devastated because that's not Katrina. Katrina just doesn't disappear and not say where she's going. She always told me where she was going. Or she'd make a phone call and say, Mom, I'm at my friends. I'll be home in a little while. No phone calls. Linda says she immediately called Priest. I said, what did you do with my daughter? Oh, she'll be home. She's probably just off with her friends and stuff. Katrina's family reported her as a runaway, but always believed Priest had something to do with her disappearance. He was the last one seen with her, and he took off, and he never returned because he looks evil. He, the way he was, when I, I just never trusted him. Even when I was a kid, I never trusted him. I tried to stay away from him. In February of 1985, an officer knocked on Linda's door. He told her they'd found the body of a girl, and they needed Linda to go to the police station to see if she recognized some belongings. We sat in, in the room, and he took a little envelope and put, his, put whatever was in the envelope in his hand. And he said, now I'm going to show you something, and I want to see if you can identify it. He opened up his hand in my heart hit the floor. I was just devastated. I said, that's my daughter's ring. Where did you get that? The detective wouldn't answer me the first time. By this time, I'm getting furious. Where did you get that ring? He still didn't answer me. The third time I stood up and pounded my fist on the table and I said, where did you get that ring? That belongs to my daughter. And right then and there they knew that it was my daughter's and they found my daughter's body. Linda was in shock. Oh, I didn't know who my own kids were. I didn't know who my husband was. I was just so devastated. Priest was eventually charged with Katrina's murder, but the jury found him not guilty. Uh, frustrating. You talk about frustrating. How, you know, you just wonder what these people were thinking. The jury's verdict didn't change what the Chile family believed. He took my sister away. I think about her 24-7, 365 days a year. What she could have done. Um, what she would be like. She was my big sister. She was my role model. I have nights where I can't get to sleep at all. And I still hear her, I still hear her voice. I still see her face. I mean, I wish this nightmare would just go away and I could wake up and say everything is gonna be okay. But it's not, it'll never be okay. 
On January 4th of this year, Martin Priest was charged with capital murder in the Miller County. In Miller County, it's in the disappearance of Tammy Sue Rothganger. Priest currently is in prison in Kansas for another murder there. In August, he comes up for parole. KRCG 13 reached out to Martin Priest, but did not get a response. According to court records, Priest does not have an attorney for the capital murder charge he faces in connection to Tammy Rothganger's death. In a statement to KRCG 13, Miller County prosecutor Ben Winfrey said, quote, I cannot comment on any pending case under both Missouri law and the professional rules of ethics. Specifically, the law states that a prosecutor should not make any extrajudicial comment. As such, any comment outside of a court proceeding is not allowed. Appreciate the opportunity to come. We asked uh, the mayor if we could just have a forum um, to present a little bit of recognition to Chief Kidwell. Um, as most of you probably know in this community, back in 1984, 15-year-old Tammy Rothganger went missing. Um, I was 13 years old at the time, right? Um, wasn't involved, obviously, in it at that point in time. In about 2006, uh, Chief Fair contacted the, the FBI and said, hey, we're, we're kicking up a cold case investigation here. We want you guys to, to participate. Can you jump in and, and work this thing with us? And we did. So in 2006, we opened up an investigation, and in about 2008, uh, Brian came into the picture. Um, so after a couple of years, not that we had run all of our leads, but we were kind of obsessed um, in going a certain direction on this case, looking specifically at Marty Priest and trying to prove specifics about him. And Brian, who I had heard of before, uh, he was in law enforcement before, and I had heard of Kidwell, uh, all good things, of course. Um, I tell you, he came into this case and immediately breathed new life into it um, and, and pivoted the case and took it in a whole new direction. And Brian's um, approach, which is true to character from what I'm seeing with Brian, he's, he's the most um, unapologetically tenacious investigators and law enforcement officer I have, I've ever met. Um, so he came into this thing and he said, hey, look, let's not, uh, let's not focus on our main subject. Let's focus on this passenger that was supposedly in this car. And Brian did a tremendous amount of research. We spent the next decade uh, going in a whole new direction on this thing, and it brought us to where we, where we ended up. Now, along the way, um, boy, we really employed a lot of resources. We used, gosh, we used uh, our evidence response team, the aviation team, surveillance, our SWAT team even came out. The state patrol gave us uh, cadets to do a number of different searches out there. I mean, we were pulling resources from everywhere, and we traveled uh, or did interviews, had interviews conducted all over the place. Um, Kansas, Missouri, Seattle. Nebraska, um, yeah, Seattle, Florida, uh, even Hawaii, this case touched. Um, and it was a lengthy investigation. Um, I've had two kids. I've got a nine-year-old daughter and I've had two kids in the time it's taken us to work this case. But it would not be where it ended up, which was, as you guys know, on January 16th, or in January of 2016, we arrested Marty Priest. Um, we had a um, very brave prosecutor that agreed to go ahead with charges, even though we didn't actually have um, a body, so to speak. We didn't have, we had not recovered Tammy, and he courageously went ahead. And then this year, uh, we got a conviction against Marty Priest um, and uh, sentence of life, um, which is amazing. And then the judge uh, felt so compelled that he made his life sentence consecutive to the sentence that Marty is currently serving for a murder over in Kansas. Uh, which satisfied our greatest desire that that marty priest just stay in jail and never get out so along the way um brian probably remembers this uh our director gets briefed from time to time uh, about cases and our special agent in charge of kansas city division actually briefed him on this case and jim comey who like him or love him uh, in today's political environment um, he called me um, to talk about this case i missed his call it's probably good because if somebody on the other end of the phone would have said, hey, this is James Covey, I said, said, yeah, sure it is. Give me a raise, boss. Um, but he left a voicemail and was very complimentary about the case, said he'd been following it, uh, wished us luck, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then in addition to that, our current director, Chris Ray, has also been briefed on this case. Um, and Chris Ray is, uh, Director Ray is aware of the outcome, and he has sent out a certificate that we wanted to present to Brian. Um, recognizing Brian's influence on this case and, and how essential he was to a successful conclusion. Thirty years for the friends, family, and community of 
15 year old Tammy Rocket. It has taken 30 years to know what finally happened to her the day she got into a vehicle with the defendant and vanished never to be seen again. We know now through an accomplice, somebody who actually committed the acts with the defendant, that Tammy was raped, strangled to death, her body stored in the accomplice's home until the defendant could find a spot to throw it in the ground and leave it to rot. That's what we know now. But it wouldn't be until around 1989, or 19, sorry, 19, 2009, 25 years later, that we would get a break in the case. We're going to go back to May 16th of 1983. Tammy was 15 years old, lived with her mom and her older brother in a house across the street from Eldon High School. Eldon was a small town, still is, uh, close to Lake of the Ozone. And May 16th for Tammy was no different than any other day. It was a school day, and her usual habit was to get ready and leave a little bit early, walk across the street, and hang out with friends. She was a social butterfly, had lots of friends. And she did that day. She left her home, got to school about an hour early, and was hanging out with a friend outside the school having a smoke. She wasn't supposed to, she was 15, but she was having a smoke. When a car driven by the defendant uh, pulls around the corner and the defendant waves for Tammy to come over. He's driving her brother's car, and the only thing unusual was that Tammy had uh, uh, gotten in his car and wrecked it the night before. So he was driving her brother's car. She goes over and she waves, he waves her over and there's a conversation. The girlfriend does not hear the conversation. But Tammy says, I'll catch up with you later. And then gets into the passenger side and will vanish forever. There was a passenger in that car with the defendant that got out of this two-door car to let Tammy in. The identity of this passenger would remain a mystery to law enforcement and investigators for another 25 years. Teresa, the girlfriend who's going to come testify, did not know who he was. She did not recognize him. And so when this young man got out and left her in the back seat, she didn't know. The defendant drove off and Tammy was never seen again. From law enforcement's perspective, when Tammy didn't show up after school, go home, wasn't seen at the school, uh, they began an investigation. They began looking for them. They never found them. Mom looked through her stuff for any clues to what happened to her. Nothing. They talked to Teresa, who identified and was able to talk about the car. They identified the car. But they couldn't identify who the pastor was. And was the defendant a person of interest? Absolutely, he was. Was a person of interest. But two things were missing for law enforcement, and they would be missing for a long time. One of two things would be necessary for them to arrest him, to charge him with any sort of crime involving Tammy. Without one of these two things, no matter what behavior the defendant engaged in, and we'll talk about what behavior he engaged in after Tammy vanished, they couldn't do a thing about it. They didn't have a body. And not just the body, but the body that would tie back to something the defendant did. And they didn't have an eyewitness. Not just an eyewitness to see her get in the car, but an eyewitness who could tie someone to doing something nefarious. The tank. It's not to say they didn't have suspicions. Uh, that morning, the defendant borrowed the car saying he was going off to work, but he never went off to work. There was a missing period of time after he picked up Tammy uh, that was not accounted for. He did pop up, pop up on the radar at uh, 7.30 when Tammy went missing, around 9 to 9.30, he pops up at his sister-in-law's house unexpectedly asking to borrow a shovel. 
and insistent that he keep telling her, she keep telling him the time, the times, the times. Uh, later that evening, he leaves the state of Missouri. No body is found, and eventually he gets in contact with Tammy's mom. Uh, by the way, Tammy's mom and him were dating. Uh, that's how he had contact. He was the boyfriend of the last couple months. He didn't live in the house, but he did stay the night from time to time. And it would take us a while to know that there was maybe more to that story than just him living there, as connects him to Tammy. But at the time, all they knew was mom's boyfriend picked her up, Tammy Nash. We don't know who the pastor was. We can't find her. And the defendant came back, offered to help mom search for her daughter, claiming that her daughter was secretly in contact with him. And that to the exclusion of Tammy's mother, her brother, her family, her friends, her teachers, or any other human being, he was the only one she was having contact with. And that effectively they couldn't break up. They had to stay together. If David Nicholas were telling the truth, there'd be closure. If David Nicholas were telling the truth, Mystery would be solved. There will be no Bible. By the end of this trial, the Rock Painter will still be missing 34 years later. The state mentioned 1984, but this case begins 2010. In 2010, police get a tip. That David Nicholas may have been with Martin Priest when Tammy went missing. They go to see him. David's not a suspect, David's a witness. Police are adamant they just want help. What does David say? I have no truthful information. If I could help you, I would. But I have no information. God say, okay. They leave. Months go by. They come back. Because they want <coughs> to make sure that he has no information. And David, again, is adamant. He has no truthful information. He doesn't know pain. He barely met Mark. In fact, he says, if I can help you out with, I've got kids of my own. And I want to make sure that anyone who hurts a kid, I want to make sure that they're going down for it. But I can't help you because I have no information. I wasn't there. Look somewhere else. And interestingly, around this time, David's writing letters. He's writing letters to his mom, to his brother, and to a pen pal that he had in each letter. He's saying, these cops are coming up and they're harassing me. I don't know why they're harassing me. They say I had something to do with this murder, but I didn't. They need to start looking somewhere else. And so it goes. 2011, nothing. 2012, nothing. 2013, nothing. 2014, something happens. David Nicholas is picked up for trafficking firearms between state lines. He says, at the time, he's facing six life sentences. Today, he's going to say he was facing 15 years. Whatever the truth is, he's facing time. And at this point, in this context, the memories begin flooding back to him. Now he remembers being wrong. Now he remembers being in that car. Now he remembers going out to that gravel road. Now he remembers seeing Tammy Rock Gay choked and killed. Seems to be information that the police have been looking for for a long time. Prison and part of it. 2014, he's 44. And
Teresa saw Tammy get in that car. She saw the passenger get out. Someone who was large for his size, that was David. True. In those interviews with her, we've seen her show, we watched, we read her books. She was busted for insider trading. She did not go to federal prison for insider trading. She went to federal prison for lying to an FBI agent. I think that somehow, some way, Tammy played a role in this. But somehow, some way, that memory of that David might have broken pretty quick if they had found out. Well, that family had a way of keeping its dark secrets. Secrets that David That's the same. Rephrase. Thank you, Your Honor. I'm concerned about this case where the star witness were being harassed by other kids. But that day, somebody looked outside the window and saw that happen. And instead of turning her back, more than 30 years after the murder of a 15-year-old mid-Missouri girl, a jury delivers its verdict. Good evening, everyone. I'm Jemery. And I'm Savannah Rudisell. Thanks for joining us. 15-year-old Tammy Rothganger was last seen on her way to Eldon High School on May 16, 1984. Tammy Witz Kara Strickland was in the courtroom today and joins us in the studio now with the jury's verdict. This afternoon, a jury unanimously found Martin Priest guilty of first-degree murder. Priest was first charged with capital murder in January 2016. Now, Priest could face the death penalty. The jury took just around two hours to make its decision, and Rothganger's mother shared her support for the jury following the verdict. I want every one of them to go home and have a good night's sleep tonight and know that they did the right thing. That's important. Priest is currently serving a life sentence for a separate murder in Kansas, and his sentencing is scheduled for November 6th. 